We knew Ms. Comrade Moss. I'm glad with the widow of one of those who fell that the emphasis is not on the pain, the emphasis is on the solidarity. And it's beautiful to read the responses of our president, Oliver Tambo, and your president, Samora Mashera. The language is so clear, it's so passionate, it's so strong. And it uses this occasion to deal with something very profound, even ancient. It's the solidarity of peoples over centuries. When the colonists came with their guns, with their tricks, with their money, the whole of Southern Africa was affected. When the mines were established in Johannesburg, hundreds of thousands of Mozambicans were sent up there by the Portuguese government. Portuguese government being paid in gold, the miners getting a very, very small amount. It was that solidarity of pain, the solidarity of suffering, but also a solidarity of resistance and of hope. And for me, what's been so remarkable about Mozambique is the huge impact it's had on my life. My presentation is going to be very personal. It's going to be very political. Never in an interesting and long life have the personal and political been so strong as the time that I spent in Mozambique. And I begin, I've been 11 years in exile in London. And we'd have ANC meetings once a month, usually in a Labour Party town hall, really cold, You'd get out the seats for all wooden clunk, 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 clunk. Comrades, you are now sing the national anthem. Wearing your heavy overcoat. Aussie sticker heavy. And all the hands go up. And I had a right arm then. My right arm didn't go up. Oh. The stupid right arm <laughs> didn't go up. Everybody else is, oh, yeah. Good. oh okay. This arm didn't go up. And in a way, this arm knew that I was, wouldn't say defeated, I'm doing lots of work, anti apartheid work, but I've been crushed. Two long spells in solitary confinement in South Africa, sleep deprivation, collapsing on the floor, water being poured on me, our leaders all in prison, my client, book sponsor, one being beaten to death, other clients of mine beaten to death, tortured. My arm was just down. And in 1976, I'm teaching at the University of Dar es Salaam. I finished the teaching there and I have a chance to come down to Zambia on the Tazara Railway and then to fly to Mozambique. He knew nothing about Mozambique. Somehow the different colonizers had their own silos, spheres of influence. <coughs> it was a place that some white people would go to on holiday to drink beer and eat prawns and for the men to have sex across the color line, which they couldn't do in South Africa. It was trivialized in that way. And the plane lands, and I see Zona Libertada do money died. Liberated zone of humanity. And I see a soldier, a black soldier, standing there with a gun. I've never seen a black soldier with a gun. Only whites had guns in South Africa. It's a gun on our side. Gun on our side. I feel elated. And two 
two days later, I'm invited to Mashava Football Stadium. It's the day of the launching of the armed struggle. There's 60,000 people there. My friends say, there's some order, there's some order. And I look across and I see it looks like a little man. And 60,000 arms go up into the air, including my arm. I got my courage back in Mozambique. Viva Mozambique, viva! It was so wonderful to be here in those days, that some of you will remember. It wasn't just the Mozambique independence. It was the revolution. The revolution was a big kind of. It was more profound than just getting a new flag and a new government. It was creating a new society. And there was so much that was positive then. And we would hear stories about Samora's wisdom and the struggle inside for Limo. And how the reactionaries wanted to execute and capture Portuguese soldiers, and the progressives and the Samora said, no. These are children of peasants in Portugal. We will treat them with dignity, and they will become our best ambassadors, because they will go back and they will explain to Portuguese people and we heard the other story of Josina Michelle wanted to bear arms. She wanted to fight. And some of the men who actually said, no, in our culture, in our tradition, men do the fighting and women support the men. Better arguments over that. And she won that battle. And then the question of who is the enemy? But the reaction is saying the enemy is anyone who is not of black indigenous African origin, which would have included a number of the leaders of Fredemo. And Samora and the others saying the enemy is not a race, the enemy is a system of oppression. And that's important because we fight that system. We don't go as for targets for people who happen to have a different origin to us. But it's also important for when the change comes. Because when the change comes, we want to change the system. And you know, Victor, a very amusing thing for me when I'm studying Portuguese in the special training they have for cooperantes. And the books in Portugal would say, can you show me where the bank is? Uh, can you point me to the railway station? And the texts I'm reading are all about Escangaliar o Aparelho do Estado. Long fancy words in Portuguese, but connected with, connected with destroying the apparatus of state. You can't take the colonial state and just put black people in charge because it will still be an oppressive state. And Samora saying, some people don't mind being eaten by a local lion as long as they're not eaten by a foreign tiger. <laughs> and it's wonderful to be in that ambience and to feel the energy and the solidarity of the unity, to feel what is called people's power. And we would be saying, power to power to the people, what do power to the people mean? And it seems this is what power to the people meant. There was a tremendous emphasis on culture. Uh, culture that had been lost of all the people in the rural areas with their homemade instruments and their dancing forms and their songs and wonderful festivals. We would go day after day, night after night, to hear this marvelous music and dance. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a very patriotic, uh, I'd say even a South African chauvinist when it comes to bragging about our singers, that we have the greatest singers in the world. Choral singing, popular singing. But you Mozambicans have the greatest dancers in the world. <coughs> it was just amazing to see the festival of dance that the people had retained right through the colonial eras. And to meet artists like Manila Kana, Shisano, and others producing the, the energy, the vitality, the creativity. It was wonderful to be at the University of Eduardo Morlan every July. And in the Portuguese July, the colonists would go back to Portugal for a long summer holiday, summer in Europe, not, not summer here. <coughs> now, the university is saying, we don't go on holiday to Portugal, we study our own country. Oh. And we have activities to Zulu, July activities. And it would be everybody, I'm not sure if the rector actually went, but the professors went, and the students went, and security people went, and the technicians went, as a community, to get to know your own country. It was wonderful to be in that ambulance. And then we hear stories like, Simone Michel's father comes to him. I'm not sure how his father addressed him. I don't think we call it president, comrade. My son, or just Samora, whatever it was. And he says, before the Portuguese sent people to my area, I was growing food on the banks, I think it was of the Nantopo. Now they've left, they've gone back to Portugal. We've got wonderful people of Portuguese origins who are proud to be Mozambican who are participating in the revolution, who make me contribution. But please, my son, can I get my land back? And the story is, and we were thrilled by the story, Papa, I don't know how he called his father, uh, Papa, uh, we didn't fight the revolution for the president to be able to give land to his father. We fought the revolution to provide food for the people. And we feel this is amazing. It's wonderful. Two years pass, and the university is closed down. Why? We have to cut rice. I'm invited to cut rice. Now, if any government has to ask LB Sachs to cut rice, they're desperate. <laughs> Even when I had two arms, I wasn't a good rice cutter. <laughs> But what had happened was that whole area had been made into a huge state farm. Enormous investment. I think Bulgarians were in charge. They put in too much fertilizer. The rice was very disobedient. It grew, grew, grew. We had to go and cut it. And be learning hard lessons all the time. But those are lessons you can recover from. But other things were becoming harder and harder. By the end, you couldn't leave Maputo except by aeroplane. Before we would travel, every, I went to nine out of, I think, you have a, 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 how many provinces? Eleven? Provinces in Mozambique? Eleven. I went to ten out of eleven. Only one I haven't been to is near, so. But I couldn't even go up the coast. Uh, 30 kilometers. We could hear the guns. The refugees are coming in. And the price that Mozambique was paying for helping us in our liberation struggle was immense. And I only wish South Africans had even half an idea of how severe it was. Of how severe it was. 
they would reroute the railway traffic from Zambia. It used to come through here to South African ports. One of the most busy ports were in Samos, in the East African coast. There's almost no traffic coming in because of economic sabotage. Then they started hitting electricity lines. We, we have load shedding in South Africa now. This wasn't load shedding, this was South African commandos bringing down electricity. And we'd go days without any electricity at all. Uh, I remember I was on the 11th floor of a building in Maputo. With foreign exchange, I could buy a canister of gas. So I'd buy that, and I'd have to walk up 11 flights in the dark. I didn't want to go out the wrong floor and give my canister to the person on the 12th floor. Uh, it was hard. We needed petrol coupons. You couldn't get petrol coupons because they couldn't be printed. The impact of the sanctions that South Africa was imposing on Mozambique was enormous. And it didn't stop simply at that. The worst of it was fostering civil war. That was the worst, the civil war. Arming opposition, uh, training, and participating on a massive scale. And you ended up, we had child soldiers in Mozambique. How horrible. Landmines everywhere. I lost an arm. So many people lost legs. The price that Mozambique paid was immense. And it paid that price because it supported the freedom struggle in South Africa. Because of the statement, it's very easy to make the statement, we can never be free until the whole of Africa is free. It's easy to make that statement. It's not easy to follow through. Most of people follow through. It even affected me, I said, this is going to be very personal. I'm in my apartment, this is just on the third floor, different apartment, and a friend of mine is at the door. Her face is bleak, and she says, can you come to Fatima's house? Now Fatima was a professor of literature at University of Edward and Milan, and it's no secret, I was infatuated with her for a long time. <laughs> and she dumped me. <laughs> There was someone else, I didn't know who it was. I discovered who it was. Somebody you would have known. It was an MK comrade, comrade Chris, and she was sheltering comrade Chris. The dog was killed. She was in personal danger. But she, like so many other Mozambicans, hid our people in their homes, risking their lives. And I was asked now to come and try and console Fatima. And I went to the house, she was under sedation, she was lying on the bed. And I lay down next to her, and she screamed and screamed and scratched me, and she said, why did it have to be Chris? Why couldn't it be you? And I understood what she was saying. I understood what she was saying. I gave her what comfort I could. And she adored Chris. And she actually made an interesting comment. She said, MK has the best and the worst. There's nothing in between. And I thought she was exaggerating, but I think subsequent events have uh, validated her, her opinion. And there were many Mozambicans who helped us quietly, quietly, risking so much for our freedom, even when things were hard in this country. Is April the 7th still the Dia de Maria Mozambicana? 
Is it so that they have now some beaten women? Yes. It wasn't changed with the new constitution. Uh, so there's one, one mistake in the exhibition at Matola. Uh, it says on the 17th of April. Uh, what I'm going to tell you happened to me. Uh, it was the 7th of April. Dia de Bolivia was in Bicana. It was a public holiday. I'm going to the beach. <laughs> Something terrible happened. I'm in total darkness. And I feel arms pulling me. And I'm saying, dash at me, dash at me, lead me, lead me. I'm a lawyer in a public place. I mustn't shout too loud. I'm a well trained lawyer. Uh, and then I feel I'm in a car. And I feel if the regime is kidnapping me, can't have a car with better springs because it's hurting. And then total darkness. <coughs> and then I hear a voice saying into the darkness, LB, Eve Garrido, Kefala Contigo, LB, it's Eve Garrido speaking to you. Shashin Hospital Central de Mozambique, the Mozambique Central Hospital. Your arm is in an amicable condition. You must face the future with courage. And I say what happened, and the woman's voice answers, it was a thaw bomb. I faint back into the darkness, but with joy. I know I'm in the hands of freedom of the Mozambique government. I haven't been kidnapped. And I had a total conviction that I would get better, and as I got better, my country would get better. I've told the story here before, but it's a new generation. So I'll tell the story again about the next morning. It doesn't work as well in Portuguese as in English for reasons which you will discover. So, I'm lying on my back. I'm feeling very light, happy. My eyes are bandaged. And I'm thinking now, what is my condition? And I tell myself a joke. It's an old Jewish joke. I'm a Jew, so I heard it like in the family. I'm in Cohen falls off a bus and he seems to be making the sign of the cross. And somebody says, Jaime, I didn't know you were Catholic. And he said, what do you mean Catholic? Spectacles? Testicles? <laughs> Wallet? And watch. Oh, that was the joke. <laughs> now, unfortunately, spectacles and testicles don't run. No. <laughs> so it's difficult for the translators. And for some reason, I started with testicles and seemed to be in order. <laughs> and I was told maybe you can confirm that the story went around the AMC camps. The first thing Comrade LB did was read to his balls. <laughs> and I've tried all my life to be macho. And that's the only time I've succeeded. Wallet, my heart seems to be okay. Spectacles, my head's okay. And my left arm slides down. I've lost an arm. I've only lost an arm. And I've never been a soldier. I was never in the armed struggle. I had huge admiration for the soldiers. But I've had that feeling in a way of battle. Will they come for me? Will they come for me today? Will I be brave? Will I get through? And I felt fantastic. They'd come for me 
they tried to kill me and they've only taken off an arm. And in a very strange way, that episode blew away all the unhappiness that I brought into exile with me. It blew away the sadness. And that was now 7th of April 1988. And I'm still happy today. Um, coming to the end, I'm not quite at the end, so I want to say what did I take with me from Mozambique. But I just want to say, Kanimambo, doctors and nurses of the Central Hospital in Mobutu, they saved my life. Ivo Goridu saved my life. I used to play bridge with him. And he told me afterwards, he heard the explosion, he went straight to the hospital. He knew there'd be injuries. And he said, oh my God, it's Albie. And then he spoke to me and I connected with him. The hospital was so short, the bandages wouldn't apply. I'd wear them for a few hours, they'd take off the bandages, boil them, they dry, they put them on again. Such a great shortage of needles. They'd use the same needles, sterilized over and over again. Having almost nothing in technology, but brilliant technique, sadly lots of experience in trauma, and they saved my life. The doctors in London were amazed at how perfectly I'd been attended to. And let me conclude by saying, what did I take with me? when I returned to South Africa. I might mention immediately, I remember that last day being wheeled to the airport, not carrying up the steps. And in the same place where there'd been a soldier before, there was a soldier now. And I'm saying to myself, no more guns. Too many guns. We've got to find another way. I've been with the revolution, I've supported the revolution, I've been lifted up by the revolution. But now I feel no more guns. And it wasn't just me. The country was suffering so much from war. And in South Africa we had to find a way of bringing about change without war, war, war. <coughs> so some of the things from Mozambique, very strong and very clear. Those principles of Fremio, liberation of women, meaning so much, and meaning so much in our struggle, and being applauded by the women in our struggle who are fighting also against no chauvinism and patriarchy. The definition of the enemy, the enemy is not a race, the enemy is a system. Those be very strong on, on that theme. We're not, in that sense, ANC is not funny in Africa. There are other African countries speaking very similar language to the language we spoke. And it went well beyond that. The popular way of communicating, the big meetings, the discussions, the dynamizing groups, the local involvement was very, very exciting. <coughs> Culture in every enterprise, uh, every factory, every hospital, every school had a cultural group. <coughs> People would sing, they would dance, they would give you a play. I've always grown. In South Africa, it was 300 years of racism. In Mozambique, it was 500 years, and you've only got half an hour to for the play. But they would skip through a few centuries. But very, very moving, the importance of culture. And that's represented now in our constitutional court. We have artwork. I got used to artwork in Mozambique. We have artwork in our court building. I hope you have artwork in your court buildings. Maybe if you can come back from South Africa to Mozambique. We have got that idea initially. 
We had a choir in the Constitution Court because we had choirs in all our enterprises. Uh, sadly, when I left the court, the choir didn't carry on anymore. They didn't want to disappoint me, so they would rehearse and rehearse. But at a more profound level, I, like so many of my generation, was very inspired by the notion of people's power. It seemed to be working. It united all the progressive forces. It overcame racism and tribalism and regionalism. It had a terrific energy and was based on the poor and the workers in the towns and the peasantry. It, it had a strong moral component as well. It was transformatory. And it seemed to be the way to go. I changed my mind because of Mozambican experience. A hard lesson, a hard lesson. Uh, you, in Mozambique, accepted pluralism. After long years of battling multi-party system, it was complicated. We, in the moments that you're speaking about, uh, designing our new constitution based not on what was happening in Europe and what Americans were saying and British were saying, based on what we thought was happening to our brothers and sisters in those and the experiences we've had, we decided we have to go for multi-party democracy. If you don't, the opposition doesn't go away, it becomes the enemy. It gets picked up by foreign forces, become part of the Cold War. And the destruction is enormous. So right from 85 onwards, we supported the idea of multi-party democracy. And in our case, a, a Bill of Rights as well, playing a very, very big role. That was huge for us. I've never thanked Mozambique publicly before for what you contributed to South Africa at a critical moment through your pain, through your difficulties, through your civil war, through your refugees, through your child soldiers, we learned it's got to be space for opposition. And if you want to feel you're mobilizing progressive forces, you've got to do it better than the others. More honestly, more effectively, you have to maintain the support and credit. It's one very last thing I have to say. It's about Samora Michelle. Uh, Rob Davis, uh, Alphys Mangesi, and myself were allowed to stay on after the Ukamaiti Accord because of our connections with the University of Waterwood Line. And we used to meet every Friday with Jacob Zuma, who was our chief representative. And Rob used to listen to the South African radio broadcast, propaganda broadcast, at 7 o'clock every morning, covering the chairs on the school. And on the one Friday, he says, Comrades, I've noticed something very strange in the broadcast. Until last week, they were saying that Simone Michelle is in the clutches of the communists and we must free Simone Michelle from their grasp. <laughs> this week, they're saying Simone Michelle is the enemy of South Africa and his back must be broken. And a week later, the plane came down. This was a week before the plane came down. And certainly the three of us have absolutely no doubt it's not just a rumor or a story. There were these false beacons that's been established, getting the plane to crash. A whole series of lies were told in South Africa to explain it, that the pilot was drunk, a whole range of things like that. So, in addition to the price that Mozambique paid for our liberation, in terms of the economic sabotage, in terms of the civil war, you, as it turned out, sacrificed your president. 
And he was on a mission then, a mission to mobilize the frontline states to strengthen their opposition to South Africa. So, in a sense, the only sadness I have now is I'm telling this to a Mozambican audience and not to a South African audience, but those South Africans who are here, I hope it's part of your experience, part of the Matol experience. You will take back something to strengthen the solidarity between our two countries, to combat the xenophobia that's ugly anywhere in any country, anywhere in the world, but particularly ugly. When the people come from a nation who paid so much to enable us to have the rights that we want in South Africa today. Thank you, University of Delhi, for having me.